Good morning, what a beautiful day, and um, I'm excited uh, to start the day with this Grand Rounds, which we always look forward to as a kickoff really to the um, new academic year. I did want to make one announcement that today will be the last Grand Rounds until we meet again in September. They are doing some construction um, in this area, including the auditorium. So we will be closed for Grand Rounds and we'll be restarting in September. Look for that email because there may be a few Grand Rounds that will have to be held at the Corporate Center because they lengthened the date on us for the construction. So we will be meeting over in the Corporate Center in four, um, 4.30, 4 4.40, excuse me, 4.40, there's a conference room over there. So look for those emails in September. Um, so without further delay, I'd like to um, have uh, Dr. Deandra come up from uh, Pulmonary, and she has a connection to this lecture for many, many years, um, and she will um, do the honors of uh, the introduction of our very special guest speaker today. So, Lynn? Good morning, um, and welcome to the first Grand Rounds of the new year. I say this every year, but it really is true. This is one of the, my favorite things that I get to do every year, um, is, to, is to be a part of the Dr. Paquette Lecture. It's, it's a great opportunity to recognize an outstanding pediatrician in our community, and it's really been a great opportunity to hear expert speakers on a variety of kind of hot topics in pediatrics. So this is the 13th annual lectureship, and as you know, Dr. Paquette is a pediatrician here in Milwaukee. He was in private practice for many years. He was a staff physician here at Children's Hospital. He is now retired, um, but he's had a memorable career um, in many areas of medicine. But I think um, perhaps what he's best well known for is really his, his work as a pediatrician, taking care of countless number of children over the last um, several years, many years. We're very proud to have this lectureship named in honor of Dr. Paquette. I'm not really sure I'm supposed to say this, but he just celebrated his 90th birthday this weekend. Um, and we're very pleased to have Dr. Paquette here with us today. I do want to tell you a little bit about this lectureship, which is, was established by the Just family, and we're happy that Dr. and Mrs. Just are here with us today. There are five children in this family um, who are now all happy, healthy, and successful adults with children of their own. Um, but this lectureship is their way to honor Dr. Paquette, who is, a who is their pediatrician, but it's really also a way to honor everybody sitting here in this room today who in some way helped to take care of children. Our guest speaker today is Becky Curran and she is going to be talking with us about how a more inclusive society benefits us all. Becky received her undergraduate, her Bachelor of Science in Marketing from Providence College in Rhode Island and that's where she developed an interest in in being an influencer, I guess, or kind of changing things behind the scenes in the entertainment industry. So one of her first jobs um, was actually in the entertainment marketing department at Creative Artist Agency out in California. 
which is probably one of the world's leading agencies in the entertainment and sports world. And since then, she's had a variety of jobs, both on the West Coast and the East Coast, um, working with CBS Television, working with the Screen Actors Guild. But all of that work in those organizations was to support accurate representation of people with disabilities or people who would have historically been excluded um, from the entertainment or the news media. And then she began her motivational speaking career in 2011. And since that time, she's spoken at over 120 venues. She enjoys talking with school children. She speaks at corporate events to national agencies throughout the United States. She was the keynote speaker in Nairobi, Kenya, where she helped launch their Little People organization in 2013. She delivered her first TEDx talk in 2014. And she founded Disability in Media, with emphasis on ability, um, which focuses on positive storytelling about people with disabilities using social media. She and her fiance now live here in West Dallas. He is a Wisconsinite, and he enticed her to come back to, or to move to the Midwest. Um, we very much enjoyed getting to know them last night at dinner, and I'm really pleased that you guys are going to have the opportunity to get to know her this morning. We're looking forward to her sharing her experiences with us and kind of helping us learn a little bit more about how to embrace our diversity and maybe just be a little bit more inclusive. Thank you all, and thank you to the Just family for making this possible, Dr. Paquette and Dr. Lynn. Um, I really feel honored to be here and to speak to all of you today. So I'm going to just kind of talk <clears throat> a little bit about my story and kind of how I got to where I am today, and then talk about just the importance of inclusion and why it matters. So my parents are average height, average stature. Uh, my dad's actually above average stature. He's 6'4". And when I was born, they were about, both about 33 years old, and they had never seen a little person before. They didn't know what the future had in store for them. They were terrified. They were fortunate that one of the people in the delivery room at the hospital had actually seen another little person be delivered at that hospital. So they were able to identify that I had dwarfism, achondroplasia, which is actually the most common form of dwarfism. There are 400 types of dwarfism, so it's a little easier to identify achondroplasia where I do know people around the world who may still be waiting for a diagnosis after the age of 10. So my parents were fortunate to get that diagnosis, but they still needed to figure out how can we try to understand how to give her the most independent, fulfilling life possible like every child deserves. And soon after they left the hospital, <coughs> they ended up getting invited to go to another hospital in Boston to see a geneticist. They got to the lobby of the hospital and they checked in and the receptionist said, follow the sign down the hallway that says birth defects, that's where you're supposed to go. My parents were terrified. They said, why would you tell people that their newborn child who they're trying to learn about has birth defects? And that was the beginning of the journey of my parents having to advocate because they didn't want other new parents to have to have that same experience. And my dad was able to convince the hospital to change the name to genetics, which made sense because that's exactly where they were going. It took about six months for my dad to do a lot of research. A lot of information wasn't there. The internet wasn't very popular back in 1984. So he had to search hard, and he was fortunate to find a specialist in Baltimore, Maryland. So we were living in south of Boston, Massachusetts. He found someone who specialized in dwarfism, Dr. Stephen Kopitz, and he signed me up for a sleep study so we could at least get to meet this guy because he had a long waiting list. People from around the world would travel to see him. We got there for the sleep study at the hospital, St. Joseph's Medical Center, right near Johns Hopkins in Maryland. 
And the doctor, Dr. Kopitz, saw the look of fear on my dad's face and he said, come in here. He had a waiting room full of people. He said, come in here. I need to talk to you. And he asked him to tell him everything that was on his mind. And this doctor was able to convince my dad that I was going to be okay and that he was going to be there to support us on the journey. And then from that point forward, when we went to that doctor, whether it was twice a year when I was younger or once a year as I got older, he continued to remind my dad he was there to support. But we also didn't mind waiting eight hours in the waiting room because we knew he was there to support me at the very early stages. So as I was growing up, I did have uh, medical complications. A lot of things little people don't like to talk about publicly because we struggle so much to just fit into society as it is since there are so few of us. There are 30,000 little people in the United States, maybe about 180,000 worldwide. And we just don't want people to feel bad for us. But there are medical complications. And having achondroplasia, the most common type of dwarfism, there are less medical complications than some others, but I still ended up having eight surgeries growing up. I had bone taken out of my legs when I was three. I was bow-legged, and then I had bone put back in my legs when I was 13. When I got to be in high school, I ended up losing the complete, my complete ability to walk. I was actually in a sailing race, so I grew up sailing, skiing, soccer, swimming, nothing different from my average height peers, just a little slower. But I was sailing one day, and I had a wetsuit on, and I thought that it was just too tight, and my circulation was being cut off. But it was actually something larger. So something that's very common with achondroplasia if I'm sitting down, I look like I'm most of your height in the room. But my organs are still really compact. So then also, my spinal column is still really close to my spinal cord. And I ended up having seven pieces of my lower vertebrae removed by Dr. Ben Carson. <laughs> he saved my life. Uh, but the, I was very fortunate that Dr. Stephen Kopitz, who was an orthopedics doctor, said that he could not perform that back surgery because he was not as knowledgeable. And as he was getting older, his hands were starting to shake, and he just did, knew how important that surgery was, and he didn't want to mess it up. And that's how we were referred to Dr. Carson, because he had, per he had performed surgery on little people before. Got to the surgery, really had to think of all the options. My, I could have been paralyzed. The whole goal of the surgery is to prevent it from getting worse. So I didn't know if I was ever going to walk again. Di didn't know if I was going to die. Another big struggle during our surgeries is setting up anesthesia. A lot of doctors may think that they know what they're doing, but it's important to ask questions because if you don't really think about just how our organs are more compact, you may be giving us too much. That was another risk. And actually, earlier on in my childhood, my dad had to cancel one of my surgeries because the anesthesiologist was very confident, very like, I got this. Don't worry about it. And he, knew, he sent something off. So he canceled the surgery. And then a few weeks later, they went back into the hospital and met with the whole department to make sure they set up the right accommodations. I was fortunate to survive that surgery, be here today. Um, but I think one of the biggest struggles for me during that time was falling behind. When I was told that I needed to have that surgery, it was the beginning of the school year, my sophomore year in high school. Finding out that I was going to miss 29 days of school when I had been trying to keep up with my class and trying to be the best I could be. I was in all honors classes. I was getting straight A's. And then to have a setback, that was probably the hardest thing for me. I wasn't really thinking about, oh, I'm going to go get my back cut open. And it may, I may or, not, may or may not make it. It was falling behind. 
I was fortunate when I was in preschool to meet a friend who my parents got to know her family well and they set it up where I could be in her class from preschool to seventh grade and that really helped prevent me from having any potential bulliers come near me. Uh, there could have been times where maybe she just told people not to bug me that, and it, I just didn't notice any and unfortunately that happens a lot to people today and I was lucky to have that support so I had a really great group of girlfriends we all got along so well and then when we when I got back from surgery I caught up I caught up with my class I was worried about even going back a grade they offered to do that but I just wanted to stay on track I had to go down a level in classes to college preparatory but then by my senior year, I was able to get back into the honors and AP classes. And, but during that junior year time frame, after I was fully recovered, I had all the support of the community, my friends started liking guys. And that was very tough for me because they just didn't think I could be around. They thought that I was going to get in the way of them meeting and dating guys. So that was a very tough time, even though the surgery time was difficult, just emotionally, starting to realize that I am different from everyone else and they're afraid to be around me because I'm different. They think I'm going to ruin their game. And it took that whole year for me to really come to terms with it's okay to be comfortable in my own skin and to do things on my own. Or my parents were home with me all those times when I was really upset. Now I would hang out with them any, any time. I think during that time you just think just in the moment of why am I being left out. But I started to realize that I don't want to be around people who don't want to be around me. And as we got to senior year, everyone started getting along because we were all getting prepared to go off to college. I ended up applying to nine colleges and I ended up choosing Providence College in Rhode Island because when I walked into the cafeteria on my tour, there was another little person. And this meant a lot to me because if an environment has been exposed to at least one little person, hopefully they have the decency and respect to treat me the same way as they do this other little person, which really is no different. But I think people just get so hung up on what do I do, what do I not do, where if one person is there to break the ice, it makes the transition a little easier. And af after I ended up getting into Providence College and deciding to go there, I was preparing to meet my roommates that freshman year. And one I got along really well with on the phone. The other one I got along well with and met her in person. And we, we were fine. But there was one who I felt like I got along with a lot better than the other one. And we ended up meeting in person for the first time after we moved into school. And in any of our conversations on the telephone ahead of that, I didn't feel like I needed to tell her that I was a little person. And it was, this was before a lot of the social media platforms were big, so there was no way for her to find out. I had participated in this urban action program, which is kind of like Habitat for Humanity, which allowed me to go to school three days early and move in three days early. She then came on that fourth day, and she pushed all of my stuff that I had moved into the corner of the room the minute she saw me and was just disgusted by the fact that I didn't tell her I was a little person. So it's a scary enough transition to try to go off to college, be independent on your own, but then to be reminded every day in your dorm room that it's not okay to be different, it was scary. And I had to work through it. I just, we kind of were in our separate lanes. And I did end up trying to move out about six months after I was there. And there really wasn't an opportunity. So we kind of just had to deal with it. But it was one of those other moments where I had to continue to prove to someone that I'm not going to jump out at them and I'm not going to scare them. I'm going to let them live their life. And we got along really well on the phone. So why can't we build a friendship? And it's funny because 
she hears this story because she knows it happened and she since then has reached out and feels really bad that it happened but it's just kind of part of the story and if I don't tell these situations that happen people don't understand what goes on in our everyday life. Around uh, the time where we were picking housing for the next year I ended up rooming with someone who I met through that urban action program and we became roommates for the next several years and she to this day is my best friend and one of the reasons why I appreciate our friendship so much is because she is not afraid to tell me if I'm doing something wrong. I think a lot of times people fear giving that constructive feedback but she is not afraid to give it and I'm open to receiving it and I think that's important for everyone to learn even when you're treating patients or talking to people if you don't give them constructive feedback or tell them about mistakes they may be making maybe you may want to say can I give you some feedback kind of offer the opportunity but it's important because that's the way that people learn and I, I was a marketing major in college so as I kind of started transitioning to the entertainment industry it was because of an internship I had my before my senior year in college I ended up applying to 120 ad agencies in Boston just saw the Boston Business Journal sent my resume everywhere and the one that got back to me was called Allied Advertising and they're the in intermediary between the general public and the movie companies we would screen advanced screenings of movies like Happy Feet or any other movies that were opening around that time it was around 2004 2005 try to take some notes on how people reacted to the advanced screenings so then we could send them back to the studios and then they could make changes if they wanted before the wider release and I started to just learn how much the in entertainment industry influences society and just how much people take it seriously in Providence there's a mall where the parking lot is at the bottom of the mall and then the top floor is where the movie theater is and some people would have their flip phones and they would have the cameras on there and if you saw those we had to t turn them away because we were afraid that maybe they were going to try to take pictures or film the, the movie they were watching and that couldn't get out there so we had to tell people that they had to go back down to their car put their phone in there and then come back if they did that after I went back to school I was able to still cover some of the screenings in Providence but I also ended up doing an internship at the NBC affiliate in Providence so I did promotions publicity all marketing related and while I was there I ended up meeting a casting director who was looking for a stand-in for Peter Dinklage in the movie underdog so everyone likes to see Peter Dinklage because his career has he's done really well for himself and I think one thing that people really admire about him is he's known for his talents as a talented actor he actually has chosen not to be an advocate for little people and that's okay because he is living his life and people want to be known for the skills the things that they're good at it would be nice if we could have him talk a little bit more about it but hopefully someday we're hoping because he has two kids now we're hoping that one would have dwarfism but because <laughs> I think a lot of times that's when the change starts happening I have a friend who she um, does, has an amputee on her right hand and she never identified as having a disability because she can hide it but the minute she had a daughter with achondroplasia she knew she had to be an advocate and I think sometimes that would take that extra push but we appreciate him for what he's done for our community just representation wise I, so I was asked to be a stand-in where I would go to set and they would set up the lights with me as my height about his height so then he could come in whenever this, they were ready to film so it's kind of just making sure that we don't waste his time so he can just be ready to act and a lot of times they do that for children as well because they need to go to a certain amount of schooling there are, are t 
teachers on set that will help them go through the schooling, but that allows time for them to be able to do that. Unfortunately, when I was offered that opportunity, it conflicted directly with my last two weeks of college. And as I was saying before, my biggest fear is falling behind, and I needed to take that road of finishing college. But I made sure that I didn't burn a bridge, and I met this cast, I had already met this casting director. I wanted to see how the casting process worked, so I was able to figure out how to help her out for the summer so I could still help out on the movie but in the casting capacity. And I would sometimes call up to 300 extras a day where they would just have to go to set to look like a crowd or whatever the scene is for the movie. And it was so funny because you, they don't film very often in Providence, Rhode Island. So when people would go to set or choose whether or not they could make it to set, they would cancel life-threatening doctor's appointments because they just wanted to be on a movie set. I was like, I don't want to be responsible for whatever's coming next, but if, if you say you'll be there, okay. During that summer, actually, it was during college was really the time where I realized, especially with the experience, my friends liking guys, and also just that experience I had the first year of college with my roommate, that I wanted to start to get to know people like me. And I had the opportunity to go to a Little People of America convention. It was my first one at the end of my freshman year in college. And that's when I started to really build a strong network of people. I ended up meeting someone who apparently was born around the same time as me in Boston. But then it, when we were six months old, his family moved out to California. I didn't know we had any relationship with this family, but they were coming to the convention in Boston and they asked if we were going. I said, yeah, let's, let's go, sure, even though I was a little nervous. And I made sure I split it up with some things that I would do with my high school friends or college friends throughout the week so it wasn't just full on going to a convention and trying to fit in and figure it all out. But this guy who we met, whose family we met, he was around my age, he ended up going to the, wanting to go to the convention specifically to chase a girl. So, and he was just so set on it. But we met and he said, this is my group of friends. Go be friends with them because I'm not going to chase this girl. And it was probably the best thing that could have ha happened because I was able to come into a group that had already exists, had a strong bond all around my same age. And it just continued to build from there over the years. I would fly out to California, meet people, and it just happened that a lot of people lived in California. So that was one of the reasons why I decided that I wanted to go out to California after that summer when I was doing the casting. One of my friends was telling me about how he's an actor and he has a talent manager who's a little person and he wanted me to be able to go work for her just to get more experience and it was an excuse to move to LA. Unfortunately, the minute I got to LA, the lady disappeared, no clue where she went, still have never met her, but she got me to LA. <laughs> My parents said they were, they were dragging their feet because they wanted to make sure if I was going to move to LA that I needed to have a job and a place to live. I found a place to live with the friends I had met through the Little People organization, but, and I found a job, supposedly, but I got there, fell through. Had to figure out what was gonna happen. My parents were still there, they stayed for about a week, so they knew that this had fallen through by the time we got there. They tried to stay patient. I was fortunate that I had some graduation money saved up and was able to probably live off of it for a few months. I ended up reaching out to the Providence Alumni Network, I was surprised the amount of people who actually lived in LA. And I tried to meet with every person possible who had any direct connection to either entertainment or marketing. And then one person was an actor himself and he was able to connect me with his talent manager. And it was still, it was a free unpaid internship, but I was able to get that experience that I had come out to get. And then in the meantime, I was still applying to jobs because I knew I couldn't do that forever. I needed a paying job. 
I ended up driving around town. I bought this directory called the Hollywood Creative Directory, and it had all the addresses of all the studios, sent letters, sent out about a thousand letters and resumes, ended up going on a hundred interviews, sometimes up to four a day. And every time I walked in the door, I was judged based on my appearance or based on how the media portrays little people and what someone may or may not have seen before. If it's a positive portrayal, they may treat me with a little more respect. If it's a negative portrayal, there's a lot more fear involved. But still, there was that hesitation. It was clear that my resume and my cover letter brought me in, so it meant I was qualified to do the job. And I didn't apply to anything that was like management level way above. I was strictly in entry level jobs, out of school, several internship experiences, but every time I walked in the door, I was rejected just by body language. We would go through the interviews, but I knew it felt awkward. But I was talking about this last night, where if even after the first 10 interviews, if one person could at least give me some feedback and say, you're terrible at interviewing, that could have help me understand how to get better and that I need to get better, take a different approach. But I think people are just so afraid to offend, you just assume that it's because they don't know what to do with me. And someone actually talked about this recently. I was on a panel at the Little People Convention just last week in San Francisco, and he said that he was applying for this. He's a little person. He works for the Miami Dolphins. He was applying for this, posi this manager position. And he went through the interview process several rounds. And then he finally got to the end. And he was not the one chosen for the job. And he asked the guy who was interviewing, what went wrong? Like, I thought I had the qualifications. And he said, you wear your emotions on your sleeve. So that's not going to work in this manager position. And it had nothing to do with his dwarfism. But he was able to get that feedback and understand all right, I need to figure out how to get better at this. And that's the only way we can get better. I ended up going through temporary placement agencies. This was about after four months of interview after interview and not getting that feedback. Because temporary placement agencies could place me somewhere to start to work, and then I would be able to just show up. And they couldn't turn me down because I was there ready to work. I did a few days at this place called Trailer Park. They just make trailers for movies. And then I ended up doing a month at the Hallmark Channel in the marketing department. Someone was on paternity leave. A lot of this was over the holidays, so it was mostly related to holiday gifts. But it was at least a way to get in places. And then it was December of 2006, getting ready for the holidays. My parents said, are you ready to come home yet? And I got really scared and frustrated, but I still didn't want to give up. So we made a deal that I could come home for the holidays, but I was able to come back and keep trying. And about two weeks in, in January, I was able to start my first day at Creative Artist Agency. I actually worked in the Hispanic Marketing Department. It was unfortunate that I took French in high school. <laughs> But I just tried really hard to work in there and fit in and figure out how the agency works. Even after a month of being there as a temporary employee, HR called me and said, OK, you're done. But I was fortunate because I was working for someone who was a Latino woman who had a lot of influence and believed in me and wanted to help me stay there because she knew how hard I had worked to get there in the first place. She ended up hiring someone who also worked at the agency who was fluent in Spanish to kind of be the main assistant. And then I was her support. And I was still a temporary employee, but I did that for several months. And then there was an opportunity in entertainment marketing where I was able to go and actually be an assistant to a person without someone else involved and talking to people who speak English. <laughs> And what was really cool about the marketing department was we 
we're different than your traditional product placement where in a movie you just see Coke somewhere. We would only let you use Coke in a movie if you talked about it. So they call it like a Coke moment. So it's ma making it be integration because the agency had sports agents, producer agents, writer agents, director agents. So we had access to all the tools to create these projects and we were able to integrate the brands into the project products. And then I was talking about Harley Davidson was one of our clients and they really wanted celebrities to ride motorcycles. So they tried to give them to celebrities who weren't already riding them. We would read all the different magazines and try to find pictures. Shia LaBeouf was not riding one, so they gave one to him, but he gave it to his mom. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, they weren't going to be able to uh, really get a good picture of him on the motorcycle. But that's the risk involved. You have to give it a try and see if it works. And then Mattel and eBay, like we would do kind of like short films based on products that were sold on eBay or Mattel, a, a toy property turned into a TV series or a movie series. It was really cool just kind of learning about all of the opportunities. And I was in the entertainment marketing department for about two years. I really figured out early on that I didn't want to be an agent, but I was terrified of trying to figure out what the next job was because at that time, after seven months, I was a permanent employee. So that felt like an honor to finally have a permanent job. And I didn't really know what I wanted next, but I knew I didn't want to be an agent. But I knew I was in this place that was just a well-oiled machine and I could learn so much. There was this training program. I did not end up applying for it when I knew I did not want to be an agent, where they basically demote you so you're helping out an agent, but then you go back to the mail room which is, like in most companies, a mailroom is a different level than some of these other programs, but it was a good way for people to get to know all the people in town. So you would have to deliver movie scripts and different videos and auditions to all these famous people around town. And you'd have to get to know them, and you'd also have to make sure you don't lose anything in the way. <laughs> but thinking about that, just even the training program, just the rigorousness, there are some things I think that we have to be realistic about, even when it comes to applying to, for jobs. I think people with disabilities have to at least be able to say that they can do everything that's listed. But we also talk about how the employer needs to be honest about what's really required. Like, does that person really have to hold a 50 pound box or can someone else do it? So it's being realistic on both sides. And I think as I was thinking about that program, and that being the step to becoming an agent, I really just didn't think it was the route that I wanted to take. I ended up moving over. There was a moment where I thought I was going to lose my job because the marketing department kind of shifted and focused more on just the creative side of things. But one of my bosses at the time was offering to bring me to the music department. He worked in music marketing were basically just brands that sponsor different music tours. He would try to find them. And right when we got there, he said, I'm probably going to leave soon, so you should figure out where you want to go. You can stay, you definitely stay at the agency, but let me know where you want to go. Another terrifying experience, but I had the opportunity to go out to comedy clubs all around the town. And there was this group, it was called, it was kind of like participating in an extracurricular like employee resource group or student advisory council or something where I would go out to clubs, I would write notes similar to the experience I had at the ad agency and I would send the notes to the comedy department and I went to up to four shows a night and I would send them all my notes and it also allowed me to try to develop an eye for talent, <laughs> figure out who was maybe worth talking to and who wasn't. Another great thing about that which is sometimes scary, is going to a comedy show. They're already joking and being crazy, especially if a lot of drinking's involved. So I'm sitting here in the audience, st stick out like a sore thumb. So if someone's making a terrible comment, that's going to affect how I write a review about them. And that was an interesting perspective to have as well. There were never times where I felt unsafe, but 
there are definitely some comments that were not necessary and I was able to include those in my notes. Once there was an opportunity in the comedy department, I was there for two years. I actually found out right when I started with the boss that I was working for that she was pregnant. I saw a fax of her pregnancy test or her, her results because any time an agent would get a fax, the assistant would get the same fax, similar to if people are getting the same emails. And I freaked out a little bit. I even was a little vocal about it maybe to someone that I shouldn't have trusted and I did. And he said something to my boss that I was just going to leave while she was on maternity leave. And I had to figure out like over the course of a weekend if I was going to stay or leave. And I, I did not know what was going to happen next so I figured out I was going to stay and I would work through the maternity leave and I ended up working even longer than that. But as I started approaching about five years at the agency, I really wanted to figure out what was next because I knew that just wasn't the future I wanted even though it looked glamorous. I started getting asked at the agency, what was it I was passionate about? And I felt it was finally the time to be able to voice my passion. I said, I'm passionate about changing perceptions of people with disabilities in the media because that affects how we're treated in society. And I got the support to be able to put on a panel discussion. It was in October 2011. And I brought together actors, writers, producers who happened to have disabilities, sharing their story in front of a theater of about 160 people. Unfortunately, only about two or three agents from the agency attended. But I got enough people from around town to support the event. And that's kind of when I gave birth to the disability and media brand where I was tired of waiting for us to see these portrayals. And why don't we just start looking at all the great news stories that are out there of positive things that people are doing. Because people, don't, if they don't see themselves, they don't think they can be it. So if we populate the internet with stories of people doing things that you may think are impossible, especially in the sports arena, I think people assume that once they become disabled, it, if something happens later in life, I only know the lived experience of being a little person, but those people who have those things that happen later in life, they may automatically think that they can't participate in their favorite sports. But you can, just in a different way. And I started to try to get people in the entertainment industry to start sharing their stories, especially if they were invisible, because a lot of times people may be a parent or a relative. And one of the partners at the agency who represents some very high profile people told me that he had a dad who had no legs and he lived with him and he took care of him for the eight years before he died. And I asked him, has anyone at this agency heard that story? And he said that I was the only one who he told. And it got me really frustrated and upset because if more people shared their story, we'd be a lot further along, especially someone who can influence so much of what goes on in the entertainment industry. I was like, okay, I've got to figure out what's next. Through the comedy club coverage, I ended up meeting a person who worked in the casting department at CBS Television Studios. So a lot of it was networking. After that first transition into the talent agency, when I started networking, I was able to kind of network to my next jobs. And I ended up working at CBS for a year. I worked for two people. The one who I saw at the comedy club wanted me to be there. The one who was his partner who I also worked for did not want me to be there. So it was about a year long of trying to prove that I wanted to be there even though one person didn't want me to be there. But I really tried to voice my passion for changing what we see even in casting notices. If it says, a teacher? Why well, can't it be a teacher with a disability? And it doesn't need to be every role is someone with a disability, but people with disabilities or talent with disabilities aren't even able to play themselves. And then there are these actors that are playing disability and they get these Oscar awards for this amazing performance even though they don't necessarily know the lived experience. Around that same time, 
there were two films that came out, Mirror, Mirror, and Snow White and the Huntsman. Mirror, Mirror had little people as the seven dwarfs. Snow White and the Huntsman had name actors who everyone likes to get for box office numbers, but then they used computer animation to shrink them down, and then they were also acting as little people. And if you ask them, have you ever met a little person? Most likely, they haven't. So they're acting based on how they would have seen us in previous media portrayals. And that's why it's so important, even there was a film, uh, Me Before You, that people get very frustrated about, especially people in the wheelchair user community. Because it's not just that an actor who does not have a disability plays the wheelchair user. The plot line suggests that people who are wheelchair users are suicidal. And we can't say that that's not the case at all, but that's a big perception that's being put out there. That's why this authentic storytelling is so crucial. There was a, a pilot that was being put together while I was at CBS, and I, I got to know kind of the dynamics of casting versus writing and producing. A lot of times the casting directors were afraid to change the writer's ideas or suggest that we do something different than what the description says specifically. And that led to a pilot that I read. I read all of the pilots, they're about 30 pages because it's about to be a 20 minute show that they film before finding out if it gets picked up for more shows. And it was a description of these two guys who work at Groupon. They moved from Indiana to Los Angeles to work at Groupon. One guy is a stay-at-home guy, would, Skyping with his friends, probably should have just stayed in Indiana. And the other guy wants to go out and socialize. So he goes to a coffee shop and he meets this guy who's described as two inches taller than a little person. I'm like, why can't it be a little person? And the, they, just didn't want, they just didn't want to ruin with what the writers had written. And they went searching hard and long for that little person, or that two inches taller, and didn't find it. And even the dialogue was so rich because the guy who was staying at home made fun of his friend for making friends with the short person. And that it's just the reality of what happened. So I wouldn't say that's a terrible script. I would say that's a great story to tell because it's a real, realistic story. And they ended up coming to me like the day before the table read, which is the day before they get ready to film. And they said, we can't find anyone. Can you help us find a little person? It's like, it's a little late. <laughs> and they didn't end up finding someone. They just ended up using someone who was short, not a little person. But it was, if they took the opinion or just had more of an open mind earlier in the process, we wouldn't have gotten to that point. And those things kind of continued to happen also around the same time. This was in 2012, around October, November. My, one of my closest friends, who was also a little person, a foot shorter than I am, he was my roommate at the time. He was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and it took a toll on me because it was having a friend who I lived with and watching him. He was an actor himself, so a lot of what I did in the entertainment industry was trying to change the experiences that he had. He was misled a lot where he would go to an audition and people would assume, or they would say, oh, you're going to go do this, but then it was something else. Like they said, you're going to come be a mini Tommy, Tom Cruise. And then they said, oh, this is a play on two and a half men and you're the half man. Like they just miscommunicated with him. And he already tried hard, similar to Peter Dinklage, where you turn down even though there's money involved with all the roles out there. If it's going to be something that's really negative, you need to turn it down because it's going to affect how we're all treated. He was on this Disney show and he was about to really make a big break. He was written into six episodes and he fell on set and that was kind of the beginning of liability and just his ALS progressing. And he had to move back to Georgia to be with his family so they could help take care of him. And I knew I wasn't that happy at the at CBS and I, I needed to figure out what was next. And I decided 
I'm going to take a break, go home to Boston, be with my family, and figure out what's next while I'm there. Because it was just too emotional staying there in L.A., especially since... I didn't feel like I was treated very well at CBS, even outside of my opinions on the different pilots. It was hard. I definitely hit a rough spot because it had taken me so long to get a job in the first place. And I made that decision that I was going to take a break. But when I got home, my sister was so excited to see me. My sister is actually three and a half years older. She's average height. My dad always joked that he wanted two kids. My mom wanted one, so they settled at one and a half. <laughs> and my parents actually continue to struggle to this day to make sure that they gave us equal treatment and making sure that they love, show their love for us in an equal way. And my sister and I always laugh because we have a very close relationship. But I have seen families where sometimes there's that one child with a physical difference or any type of difference. And because there's so much care involved, they kind of neglect that other child. And then there's resentment that happens at different points in people's lives. So I'm fortunate that they continue to look out for that. But she said, my students want to meet you. She's a creative writing teacher in middle school. And I said, why do they want to meet me? She said, because I talk about you all the time. And I thought, OK, well, I could come meet your students, just kind of have a day, hang out. But I don't really know if I'd feel productive. Because even when I was applying for jobs and going on all those interviews, there wasn't a day in my life where I didn't work. Like, I was working to try to work towards that next job. So I think I thought of it as, OK, I'm trying to figure out what's next. Is this going to be a distraction from me figuring out what's next? Fortunately, it was not, and my sister had me come to her class several times where I could start sharing my story. And then I started going to different rotary clubs, and I ended up going to a little people parents meeting. They have conventions every year over the week of 4th of July in a different city, but then they have 12 districts across the country, so they'll have weekend <coughs> meetings in the spring and fall. And I sat in on the parents meeting, and they started telling me about how their kids are struggling to fit in at school. And I said, all right, let me know if I can come to the school. I'll talk to the administrators, talk about the accommodations I had, which weren't that many. There are stools in different places. I had untimed tests because it took me a little longer to write. But there wasn't much that I had that was different than your average student. And then I'll talk to the entire student body and allow them to ask me the questions. So they, the child, when they're transitioning from elementary to middle school, they don't have to answer the questions they don't want to answer. And that proved to be successful, going to a lot of schools. Uh, parents continue to fight the schools for the budget and accommodations to make it possible. Uh, sometimes they have to convince the administrators that a clown presentation is a little less educational than someone coming in and educating people about differences. But while I was d building up the speaking, I also knew that it wasn't something that happened so consistently that I could fully live off. And I was actually living at home with my parents after living on my own in Los Angeles for six and a half years. And I thought, I don't want to be that stigma of an adult with a disability living at home. And they didn't think that. They wanted me to be there as long as I wanted to be. But I kind of got in my own way. And I had an opportunity come up where it was someone I had met at the panel discussion I put together in Los Angeles. And he asked me to come work for him at the Actors Union in New York, but under the condition that I could still do my speaking. And that's kind of the clause that I have from that point forward that if there's a demand, I will continue to do it. And around that time was when I did my first TEDx talk about the importance of disability portrayals in the media. And I was able to work at the Actors Union in the diversity department, where we oversaw all the different diversity committees. And I, of course, identified the most and closely with the Performers with Disabilities Committee. And I continued to watch how far behind they are, how the industry continues to leave them behind in the diversity conversation. And people were frustrated. <laughs> but the casting society started to express interest. Casting directors are a member of the casting society, so they have influence on how 
they choose the people in films and movies all around. And they started doing trainings, making sure they were training performers with disabilities and really putting more people out there and giving them those opportunities. Because every opportunity turns into something. But if people aren't given an opportunity in the first place, especially to play themselves, then there's a lot of work to be done. And people want to work. They're ready and willing and able. And I think a lot of times people think that people with disabilities just don't know what they're going to do when they show up to work. How are they going to adapt? But they forget when you wake up out of bed in the morning, there are so many things you have to do, so many adaptations that you almost don't even think about. Like when I get out of bed, I have to make sure there's a stool if it's a high bed so I don't fall to the ground. Then I go into the bathroom, hope that the toilet seat's not loose and that I don't pinch my leg. Like getting down the stairs, especially if I'm carrying a big bag, there are just so many different things that happen. We're not going to complain about when we show up to work, but it allows us to have those skills to be problem solvers. And I think that's really, as I was working in the entertainment industry, I learned that people still didn't want to think that. Uh, well, I was at the Actors Union, I was technically eligible for promotions and raises. It didn't end up happening. I even watched my boss put in a proposal. I saw it, and it was turned down. So when I was given the opportunity to work for the organization that I work for now, which is remote, so it also allowed me to move here to be closer to my fiance, uh, I was excited because now I work with corporate America on helping them with disability inclusion practices. And really, I can just focus in on disability inclusion and help people hire more people with disabilities because there's a lot of great talent out there. And I still have that passion for the entertainment world, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think if we do a lot of work in one area, hopefully they'll catch wind of it. Uh, so. Really, it's a long journey that I've been on, but I'm not wanting to give up because I want to make the life better for those people after me, especially since 80% of little people are born to average type parents. Anyone in this room, anyone in this hospital could have a child with dwarfism or any type of disability, and they shouldn't think that it's the end of the world because it's actually the beginning to more opportunities. Thank you for sharing your story with us today. I'm a genetic counselor in genetics, and my goal as well for families as much as possible to show them this is the beginning of a new story and not the end of maybe the story that you envisioned. So thinking specifically about entertainment and wanting to show either a child with achondroplasia or another disability a positive portrayal, a real, real portrayal, are there favorite um, movies or shows that you would suggest we tell families about? I mean, it's not yeah. a trivial thing. So there are a lot of shows out there about little people, especially in the reality world. A lot, some I'm not a huge fan of, but others I appreciate. I really like Little Couple because um, it shows Jen Arnold as a doctor. Uh, there's also Little People Big World because it's been around for so long built that initial awareness that we exist in society. I think it went on a little too long because now there's all different pieces. They run out of content, so then they add a little drama. But, <laughs> but it could be the, the reality of things that happen when you have camera crews following you around your whole life. I think a lot of people appreciate the story of Peter Dinklage and the station agent because it really shows him in a relationship that's w with someone who is not a little person, even though she ends up being a chair user. It's like they're just those dynamic conversations where people are talking about the realities, but OK to embrace it. And then even just with the movies, support those films where there are authentic portrayals rather than where they use computer animation or even you'll see amputees where they'll use computer amputation things for that. People don't know the lived experience. So how is it going to be as powerful as someone 
who really has that disability. And I think that's the thing, support. And also, with dwarfism, a lot of people, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, we are considered someone with a disability. We have accommodations that we may need at give, any given time, but a lot of little people still don't necessarily identify as such, and especially new parents may not necessarily want to identify, but I think it's important early on to embrace that it's okay to have a disability, and there's a much larger population out there that we could be a part of if we just embrace that fact. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I think you've spoken really eloquently to the assets that disabled people bring to the workplace. And given that we're in a room with a lot of people who do hiring, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the ideas you might have about reducing barriers to hiring for people with disabilities? In Wisconsin, 80% of people with disabilities are under unemployed. Yes. Absolutely, I could talk about that all day long, and, I can, and I'm happy to share resources that we can also talk about after this, but I think the biggest thing is make it known that you're willing to make an accommodation rather than someone having to ask for it or come out themselves. So in all of your hiring materials, whether it's the career site or setting up an interview, make it known that you're willing to make an accommodation so they don't feel like they have to hide it and then they risk their job later on. <laughs> or um, just be open to talking to people and making accommodations where you may think a job isn't for them, but maybe if there's one difference you could make, like taking off the description, like someone else can carry the boxes. That's just the easiest, obvious example, but there are things that maybe they don't need to do. Or think about if there are some things that people could do working remotely that could help maybe with the commute because sometimes public transportation does not make, make things easy. Trying to think just how you could make it welcoming, but not make it obvious that they're going to be a burden or an inconvenience, that they're going to be an asset to the workplace. So on that note, we'll, we'll stop here, but I want to thank um, Ms. Curran again for coming. And thank you. Other questions? Can you stay yes, uh, so feel free and I can make sure my information shared Happy to talk to anyone. My website is beckymotivates.com. Then it's just beckymotivates at gmail. Feel free to reach out. Happy to stay in touch. Thank you guys.